Hi, my name's Ben and welcome to the Expat Blueprint, the platform educating experts in financial freedom. So we're continuing on with our How to Invest series and we're episode number four. I'm excited today because now we're really going to get down to the mechanics of investing. We're going to talk about the different types of investments available to investors, also known as asset classes. The objective of today isn't that you walk away knowing everything that you can know about every type of investment out there. Because in reality, you don't need most of them to build a portfolio. My objective is to give you a brief understanding of what each type of investment is, how it works, how investors make money, and how it behaves in different market conditions. What I thought would be easiest if we started from the most conservative or cautious style investments and make our way up through the investments in order in which they probably are deemed to bear a little bit more risk. Now, I want to remind everyone about our little discussion in episode number two. The word risk isn't something to be scared of. Remember, it is just parallel to reward. As the risk of an asset increases, we should also expect the reward to mirror this. How much risk you're comfortable with is going to be completely down to you. Okay, so the first asset class that we're going to talk about is cash. Now, I'm going to assume that you understand how cash and how a bank account works. Traditionally, bank accounts will give you a percentage of the money that you deposit in the bank account back in what we know as interest. This is to attract you as a customer to give your deposits to that bank. Because what you might not know is that bank will use your money, invest it and make money for the bank. Some of this return is what they'll pay back their customers in interest. Bank accounts are the most basic type of investment out there. It would be considered pretty much risk free. However, like I've said on numerous occasions, if you've been watching our content is that inflation or the increase in price of the goods and services that we buy each year is silently making our cash less valuable. Yes, obviously, if you put $10,000 in a bank account for the next 10 years and you logged on to your internet banking every day, it's gonna say that there's $10,000 there. However, in reality, in 10 years time, that $10,000 is gonna have the same purchasing power of roughly about $8,400 does today. I know that might sound slightly confusing, but if you think about it, everything that we are buying is increasing around two, two and a half percent a year. And if that money in our bank is sat there, not earning any interest, then our $10,000 isn't gonna be able to buy as much in 10 years time as it can today. Hence why we need to explore other asset classes. So the second type of investment that we're gonna look at is something called bonds. Now to make this as simple as possible, just imagine them as IOUs or, or a borrowing to typically a government or a company. These organizations will often need to raise money to fund future projects. For example, governments need to fund healthcare, transport, education, and companies need to raise money to develop a new project or expand overseas. A traditional bond is a way for an organization to raise money in a loan kind of format. The government or a company will create a bond where they will entice investors to lend them money and then will agree to pay that money back in full on a fixed date in the future. In the meantime, that company or government issuing the bond will agree to pay interest on their borrowing. This is why bonds are also known as fixed income investments because the date of repayment is where the bond issuer pays you back in full and the interests are fixed. So every year, and in a lot of cases half yearly, the issuer will pay interest on the borrowings to the investor. And this happens all the way until the full amount is paid back in the future. Now we're gonna deep dive further into bonds in two weeks time, as this is one of the most important asset classes we will focus on when building a portfolio. However, in the meantime, I want you to understand that it's more than likely to be the conservative part of your portfolio, the insurance element, if you like. The next major asset class is property. Now, as an investor, you can invest in property in a number of ways, but the two most common types are the traditional way where you buy the physical property, meaning you're the owner of it, and then you benefit from both the income it produces in rent and also the capital appreciation. And then you benefit from both the income it produces in rent and the capital appreciation if the property value increases. Now the traditional method is a pretty hefty investment. Usually people's homes or property investment is the most expensive thing that they own. The value of property can often make it difficult for people to invest and therefore investors could choose to invest via real estate investment trusts, also known as REITs. Here, the fund and the fund management team will use investors pooled money. So imagine investors all pay into one big central pot and then the management team do the research and go buy a number of income producing properties. As these properties pay out returns via things like rent, this is then distributed out to investors and this is called dividends. The benefits of owning a property in a portfolio is that it firstly has a couple of ways to make a return. Like we mentioned, there's income through rents or dividends, but also capital appreciation, the value of the property or the investment fund increasing. Secondly, it also provides diversification away from other asset classes like stocks and bonds. This basically means that when stock markets are declining, 
the returns of property or the value of property will not necessarily mirror that decline. The return generated through property is not correlated or in line with stocks. Diversification attempts to help investors experience less volatility or major increases and decreases in their portfolio by including different asset classes that are independent of each other. The next asset class we're going to cover, and it's probably the most important, and it's definitely going to be the one that we're going to focus on the most going forward, are stocks and shares also known as equity. I mean, they pretty much all mean the same thing. They just refer to ownership in a company. When you buy a share of a company, you're buying a tiny piece of ownership in that company. The likelihood is you won't buy nowhere near enough to be able to walk into the CEO's office and ask him what he's doing, but you do get to benefit from the performance of the company. Again, that comes in two forms. Income is paid out in dividends. Dividends of stocks are basically a return to investors from the excess profits that a company might make in a year. They're not guaranteed and often one of the first things to go when the company is having a bad year. Sort of like how you might get a bonus at work. Most of the time, hopefully, you'll get a steady bonus. Some years the company will do really well and you will get more. And some years the company will struggle and your boss will tell you that bonuses aren't being paid this year. You're also going to benefit from the increase in the share price of a company. When you buy a share, you often do so hoping that the company has a bright future and the value of the company will increase and therefore your share price increases. This, as you know, is capital appreciation. But just remember, stocks can go down as well as up and you need to be sure that what you're investing in is gonna be beneficial for you for the long term. For this reason, investors will often buy investment funds where a fund management group will act in exactly the same way as the REITs or the Real Estate Investment Trust that we covered in property. They use pooled money from all the investors and then they select a number of different stocks on behalf of the investor. Now we would suggest that the Expat Blueprint, a type of investment fund called an index fund or an index tracker. Now this could be potentially starting to get a bit confusing, but don't worry, we'll be going into a lot more detail later in the series. Stocks, shares and equities, whatever you wanna call them, have proven to be one of the best ways to build wealth over the long term. As I mentioned earlier in the series, the S&P 500 index that tracks the share performance of the top 500 companies in the US has returned 53,641% since the beginning of the 1900s. Now, of course, when it comes to equities, the likelihood is that you remember the market crashes more than the gains, because that's what's often widely reported by the media. But the continual increase in stocks over the medium to long term has made it possible for investors to make gains that massively outpace inflation, which is the goal. Remember, we need our money to grow more than the increase in goods and services that we buy. The more we can do this, the better. Okay, so moving on to the next asset class, which is commodities. Now, commodities are any raw material or primary agricultural product that can be bought or sold. We all know that the trading of raw materials in the original sense has been going back thousands of years where merchants exchange goods between countries. However, fast forward to today and the commodities are still being traded, but on a lot more efficient scale and through stock market. Back when merchants started trading, they trade with a person who really needed the commodity to either run their business or feed their family, for example. As times have moved on, people have been able to invest in commodities, but only in the sense that they're speculating whether the price is gonna go up or down in the short term. While you've probably heard on the news of the talk of say the oil price or the gold price, I bet you didn't know that traders will also speculate on commodities such as sugar, wheat, soybeans, cattle, livestock, and so on. People that invest in commodities are basically making calculated assumptions based on the economy and world events. For example, if there's a drought in areas of Brazil causing a decrease to the supply of soybeans, then that is likely to drive the price of soybeans up. The same way, if there's tension between countries who typically trade oil together, then that often results in an increase in oil price. The way investors make money is they either buy at a low price and then sell at a higher price when it's increased, or they sell at a higher price and then buy back in at a low price if they expect the commodity to drop in value. Other than trying to make short-term gains, investors might include commodities in their overall portfolio or their collection of investments to add extra diversification benefits. This basically means that if stock or bond prices start to fall, the price of that commodity won't necessarily fall at the same rate or even fall at all. The commodity prices do not necessarily mirror that of other investors. Secondly, investors also include commodities as they naturally tend to keep pace with inflation. When you think about it, it does make sense. If the cost of the things that we buy each year is steadily increasing year on year, the raw materials or the agricultural commodities that we consume or need to build those goods are likely to increase as well. And that's probably as much as we need to cover with commodities. It's not something that we're really gonna focus on for 
throughout the rest of the course as I want to teach you about building wealth in a really simple way and I desperately don't want to try and overcomplicate things. Finally, we come to the currency market or the FX market as it's also known. The FX market is the biggest and most traded market out of all the asset classes that I've spoken about today, which again makes sense. As the world has become more globalized and we buy and sell things all over the world, trillions of units of currency are traded every day. As expats, I'm sure you're all aware of how currency conversion works. We have money in one currency, say dirhams, and we want to send that back to the UK, US or Europe, or wherever you're from. Now for us to do that, we need a bank or a currency broking service to make this exchange for us. They go to the market, sell our currency and buy back the currency we want. Currency prices are normally set in two ways, either a floating rate, which basically means that the price is determined by supply and demand. So how much people want it and how much people want to sell it. Most developed world countries would have their currency determined by a floating rate. As the demand for their currency increases, the more it will cost someone to look to exchange to buy it. For example, if I want to exchange dirhams for pound sterling and the exchange rate is five to one, that means that I have to pay five dirhams for every one pound. But say if the UK increased interest rates, which typically will then make the currency more valuable, this is likely to increase demand and therefore someone who wants to transfer dirhams to pounds will likely to have to pay more than five dirhams as per the previous example. Exactly like commodities, investors like to speculate on the movement and direction of currencies. And whilst it is the biggest market and has the most investors, it's probably the most volatile market too. So again, it's not something that we're going to concentrate on too much. It's definitely worth being aware and having an understanding of currency as we all do a lot of conversions, whether it's sending money home or do you remember pre-COVID when we used to travel and spend money abroad? Trying to find the best rate possible can be worth your time because banks and FX institutions can often make heavy margins by transferring your money. From an investment point of view, we're gonna leave this asset class alone. Right, there you go. A very quick rattle through the major asset classes. I obviously could dedicate a whole episode to each one and go into so much more detail, but the two main types of asset classes we're really gonna concentrate on and get our teeth sunk into are gonna be equities or stocks and shares and bonds. These two types of investments we'll be digging into a lot more detail as the majority of our investment strategy will revolve around these two asset classes. As always, if you have any questions about anything we've covered today or want to know anything more, then please contact us through any of our social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, or email me at ben at the expatblueprint.com. If you found today useful, then don't forget to hit the subscribe button and also leave a review. That massively helps us get this content out to more and more expats just like you. See you all next week, and remember to always dream big.